So the, the, the mitral valve is uh, a valve that lies within the heart between the left atrium and the left ventricle. So when the, the left ventricle squeezes, and that's the, the bit of the heart that pumps blood around the body, the mitral valve stops the blood leaking backwards into the lungs. And it's a bit like a parachute. If you think of it as a, a parachute with a canopy here and the strings down here with the, with the, the man or woman underneath, if the strings on one side of the parachute were to break, the canopy of the parachute would tip that way and air would spill out of the, the canopy of the parachute like that. And the, the valve, the mitral valve, is exactly the same as that. And then the, the leaflets of the valve are the canopy of the parachute. The strings of the parachute are the what we call the cordae tendinae, heart, some people call them heart strings. These are the, the cords that anchor the valve inside the left ventricle, inside the heart to stop it blowing inside out when the pressure goes and the heart gives a, it gives a good squeeze. And so when the strings on the mitral valve break, the cordae tendinae on the mitral valve break, the valve or the section of the valve with, with the broken strings to blow inside out. And that causes a leak of blood, of high pressure blood, backwards through the valve uh, and into the lungs. And that can make patients breathless and tired. And they're, they're the two most common symptoms, being breathless on exertion and also be, uh, being tired and not having your usual exercise capacity. So a, a mitral valve repair, and most, most mitral valves these days we can repair, would be required when several criteria are met. So first of all, when patients are breathless or they've had a decline in heart function, which is just an indicator the heart's having, having a bit of a hard time squeezing against the extra volume load, the extra work it's got to do. So they're the first two things. So a decline in heart function or symptoms. There are other indications as well. So when the pressure of blood goes up in the lungs, remember I said that the, the left ventricle has high pressure. So when the valve leaks, it, it forces high pressure blood into the lungs and that can put the pressure of, of blood in the lungs up. So when it goes over a certain threshold, we would say, well, look, that's enough. You probably should have an operation now. Or if you start to get an irregular heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation. Now that's a sign the left atrium, which lies before the valve is starting to stretch and it starts to fire off uh, odd beats at irregular intervals. And that's also a sign. Now, more and more these days, we're repairing valves where patients feel fine. They're not breathless, the heart function's good. They don't have atrial fibrillation and they don't have high blood pressure in the lungs because I think there's increasing evidence that early repair providing the valve can be repaired and, and, and that is the vital thing that you should go to a, a high volume surgeon who can repair almost all of these valves so there's increasing evidence that that group of patients also have a big benefit from surgery in terms of returning their life expectancy to normal for what it should be you know, of an age and sex match population. So for example, you know, a 60 year old man with a leaky mitral valve who feels well, returning his long-term survival to what it should have been of another 60 year old man who never had mitral valve disease in the first place. And, that, and that's what it's all about. So there, in a nutshell, they're the indications we work to for uh, when to put patients forward for surgery for uh, mitral uh, valve reconstruction or repair. So there are, in Liverpool, we have three options for mitral valve repair. So the, the conventional way uh, is a stomotomy where we make an incision on the front of the chest and we open the breastbone and wire it back together at the end. And that is that has been practiced for, for decades now. And it gives very wide exposure to the heart and to the valve. But as you can imagine, 
cutting through the bone is it's, it's the equivalent of a long bone fracture. So it's like breaking your leg, breaking the femur. It takes two to three months to recover from that. Um, option number two would be what we call a, a minimally invasive mitral valve repair, which is a bit of a mouthful. So we, we tend just to call it mini mitral, a, a mini mitral repair. And that's done with a two inch incision, about four or five centimeters, just on the right hand side of the chest, just to the, to the right of the right nipple under the right arm. Uh, and that gives us a, a great view of the mitral valve and the, the, the way the mitral valve lies within the heart, it lies looking towards the right shoulder. So it lies in, in this direction. So when we come in underneath, underneath the right arm, it gives us a super view of the valve and because the chest is, is effectively closed and we, we can't get to the big blood vessels in the middle of the chest for the heart lung machine. We use the femoral vessels in the groin. So you have a, a one inch cut in the groin and a little needle prick on the side of the neck um, for a, a line in the side of the neck. Now the advantage of, of that is less pain, shorter hospital stay and, and much faster recovery. Um, and we looked at patients who, several hundred patients who had this done in Liverpool. Most patients are back to normal, somewhere in the three to six week mark, whereas a stenotomy is, you know, 12 weeks. Option number three, um, which is the, 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 the latest option uh, that we've had with the only centre in the UK offering it is robotic mitral valve reconstruction. Now, if you go to the major centers in America, the Cleveland Clinic, the Mayo Clinic, Emory University, um, some of the New York centers, this is what you'll be offered. And it is truly the least invasive way to repair the mitral valve. And it's effectively similar to a mini mitral, but it's just done through smaller incisions. So the, the, the largest incision is 20 millimeters. So you have a very small incision again under the right arm. And when the incisions are that small, we can't see into the chest with both eyes simultaneously because we lose binocular vision. So we can only see with, with, with one eye at a time and moving instruments around within the chest becomes a bit more difficult because you, you develop something called a fulcrum effect. Meaning if I want to move my instrument to the left, I've got to move my hand to the right because it's going like that so you develop something called the fulcrum effect and this is where the da vinci robot comes into play because it's it, it doesn't work by itself it's not an autonomous robot it's actually a, a telemanipulator is the the real name for it but you know i think robot just sounds a bit cooler so <laughs> most people call it call it a robot the Da Vinci robot made by Intuitive Surgical. And um, that gives you seven degrees of freedom. So it basically gives you the full range of movement that you have with a, a pincer grip uh, on either hand. And it gives you the movements of your fingers, wrist, elbow, uh, and shoulder. Uh, and it gets the plane of movement right down to the plane of well. So you can maneuver needles in very tight space. And it's absolutely fantastic. It gives you 3D vision high definition as well you put your head in the, in the, in the headset especially in the console and it, it really is uh, a game changer and it allows us to do completely endoscopic mitral valve reconstruction that is the least invasive form of surgical therapy for the mitral valve and when you reduce surgical trauma surgical invasion correspondingly you reduce pain short and hospital stay and speed recovery. So um, our average hospital stay for a robotic mitral valve repair, our mean stays about three and a half days in hospital after surgery. And most patients are back to normal around about two or three weeks after surgery. We've had one, one patient in the BBC filmed, had his operation Thursday, went home Saturday and walked up the Great Orb in Clandudno, which is a uh, I gather a hurt mountain hill behind Clandudno the Monday after surgery, four days after surgery. It really is remarkable the the difference, yeah, you know, the added diff, additive difference of 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 robotic valve reconstruction.
uh, side effects of the operation. Uh, I think that depends on what you mean by side effects. There are, there are risks with all heart surgery, but the risks are very low. Uh, the, the, the two big risks that we talk about when we're consenting patients are risk to life, which is on the whole less than 1%. But it's not zero, and that's important to remember. And the risk of a stroke, which is in the region of one to two percent, that would usually be an interoperative uh, event. Um, then we can talk about other things like risk of infections, and as one minimizes surgical trauma, so the risk of infection also decreases. So wound infections, so chest wound infections with minimally invasive and robotics are, are virtually unheard of. We've been doing mini mitrals now for four, uh, for 11 years and robotic mitrals for four years and we've, we've not had a, uh, a chest wound infection in, all, in over a decade. Um, uh, what else? The, I suppose the other, it, the other side of infections uh, is that that it is possible, you know, there's no such thing in medicine or surgery as zero or 100%. It is possible to get infections even with minimally invasive surgery. We make a, this, the two centimetre cut that we make in the groin. The surgery, we think of the groin as a bit of a dirty part of the body and it's a bit sweaty down there between two rolls of fat close to the tail end. They can get infected a bit more frequently, but still at the most one in a hundred, two in a hundred. Uh, and, and they're kind of the, 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 the main risks. In, 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 I suppose the, the bigger question would be, does less invasive surgery, is it more dangerous? No, it's not. The, the major risks are the same, you know, mortality and stroke. Does it affect the, the ability to do the operation well? Absolutely not. You know, our repair rate in, in over 400 mini mitrals now varies between 96 and 100%. And that's the, the, the vital thing is that, 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 that you get a, a great repair. The three things I always say to patients when I can send them for surgery the night before are uh, on the day of surgery, the only thing that matters is, is number one, actually it's not quite, the three things that matter. Number one, keeping you safe, okay? Nothing should ever compromise that. Number two, getting a perfect repair because we don't want you to have to go through this again. The only thing worse than going through heart surgery once is having to go through it a second time if the repair fails. So, so getting number two is getting a perfect repair that hopefully lasts a lifetime. Not all repairs last, last a lifetime. If we're trying to reconstruct you know, 70, 80 year old degenerative valve tissue, it is possible it can fail. And anyhow, number two is, is try and get a perfect repair. And number three is we'll do one and two in the least invasive way possible. So safety, perfection in valve repair, and then both of those in the least invasive way possible. And we will we'll tailor the operation to the patient. So you'll see patients from all over the UK and you know, in recent years, patients from have been flying in from abroad. And most patients we can do minimally invasive or robotic surgery on. There's, there aren't many contraindications these days to that, you know, that we won't offer that. But you know, in some cases we are. And, and, the only reason we will, we or I will say that to a patient is if it will affect either. You usually it'll be a safety issue, and I think you know you want you one of the the few categories of people who would probably do better with a stenotomy. Okay, so uh, recovery depends on the operation that you've had. So if you've had conventional heart surgery uh, where you've had a stenotomy that takes realistically about three months to recover from um, option number two that we spoke about was the, the mini module the minimally invasive module most most patients are back to normal uh, in about three to six weeks with that and with the robotic module faster still because the surgical trauma is less and that would be about two to three weeks. Now, they're, they're average figures. Everyone's a bit different. You know, some recover faster, some recover slower. I, mean, I gave you an example earlier of the, the gentleman who walked up the Great Orming Club, did no four days after surgery. But yeah, that, 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 that's an average. Uh, now, in terms of 
important things to remember if you if you are having a stenotomy, in fact, if you're having any of the operations, the DVLA says no driving for four weeks after valvular surgery, and they don't differentiate between stenotomy, mini mitral, and robotic mitral. So no, no driving for for four weeks. But if you're having a stenotomy, the important thing to remember is you've got to protect your breastbone. So uh, no lifting anything heavier than a bag of sugar for six weeks, no pushing yourself up out of a chair or off the edge of the bed. When you want to stand up, you've got to wrap your arms around yourself and rock forward. But none of that applies to the minimally invasive surgery. Yeah, we, yeah, we had patients back on the te tennis court six weeks after surgery. We've had some patients back playing golf one or two weeks after surgery. So it does make, make genuinely, it does make a, uh, a big difference in terms of speed of recovery.